that and then I will oh, yeah. start talking. Um, okay. I'm going to also share my screen. So greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fourth presentation in the series of Emerging Women Scholars Talk. And thank you very much, Dr. Carmen Folker, who is our, our special guest for today and with a very fascinating topic of talking to us about North Africa and in, in Nahra and the future and what happened to them in the Arab Spring. So thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Carmen Folka is a dedicated researcher specializing in Middle East studies, Islamic studies and Middle East politics. She completed her bachelor's and master's degree in Oriental studies as Sapienza University of Rome. Her academic journey led her to Egypt and Tunisia, where she lived and studied both during and in the aftermath of the 2011 uprisings, which continues to be her primary area of research interest. Before joining King's College in London, Dr. Folka earned her PhD from the University of Otago in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Her doctoral work examined the change capacity of the uh, of the party of an nahza movement and the Egyptian Muslim Brothers in unpacking their organizational dynamics in the post-uprisings period from 2011 to 2020. Furthermore, during her PhD studies, Carmen actively participated in a funded project titled Fostering Cross-Cultural Education. Within this project, she played a role in an experimental preliminary collaborative online international learning, COIL initiative, connective political sciences studies in New Zealand with those in the Sultanate of Oman. Her research aimed to explore the educational potential of internationalization initiative for Middle East studies education in Western learning context. Dr. Falco's research interests are Islam and politics, populism and global neoliberalism, Tunisian politics, political elites and political culture, internationalization of higher education and Middle East studies. So thank you very much, Dr. Falco, for joining us. And without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much for this comprehensive uh, pre introduction, uh, Nagar. Uh, it's my pleasure to, to talk to you today. And what I'm about to present here is an in-progress, let's say, um, yeah, a work in progress. It's an article co-authored by uh, Dr. Mohamed Bushra, who unfortunately is not with us today. And this is a spin-off of a larger research project, as you mentioned, Nagar, uh, which is my PhD that I completed in uh, 2022 at the University of Otago. So this forthcoming for article is about Ennahda, uh, which is, uh, Ennahda is a Tunisian Islamist-inspired movement, which was established in um, late 1960s as a a proselytizing movement, then evolved later on into a clandestine political and oppositional movement, which underwent ever since like a constant process of change that altered its organizational outlook, its identity and its discourse. So since its legal reappearance basically in the Tunisian political scene after uh, the Arab uprisings of 2011, Ennahda experienced the exodus of some very high profile leaders and also like a progressive downsizing of its constituency. This process basically accelerated after the party leadership uh, opted basically for separating the religious from the political uh, activities in 2016 announcing that basically Nahda Paris was no longer interested in the religious uh, affairs of the country, but only in the political um, affairs of Tunisia. Having said that, our draft article basically draws on the case study of Nahda to explore uh, which organizational factors and dynamics account 
for the low uh, systemness of an Islamist born uh, party after a major organizational change, such as the case of the specialization um, in political activities. So we are basically asking uh, ourselves, I mean, I'm talking about uh, me and Mohammed, my colleague, what made actually a long-lived movement like Ennahda, uh, which survived repeated waves of crackdown for decades and also survived as a for quite a long time as a movement in diaspora, in exile, uh, succumbed to intra-party division after actually being at the forefront of institutional politics between 2011 up to 2021. So this research article, let's say that brings focus to the very latest organizational developments uh, that unfolded uh, in, inside the Nahda from 2016, as I mentioned, up to July, 2021, which actually marks the end of a Nahda's engagement in uh, Tunisia parliamentary activities, and also the beginning of uh, its struggle basically for survival uh, in the Tunisian political context because of the current president, uh, I said, uh, clamping down on Tunisian party politics. So this is a qualitative study, clearly, that relies on uh, thematic analysis of primary data that I gathered during online interviews uh, between 2020 and 2021 with current and former members of Ennahda um, from pretty much the entire organizational spectrum. I conducted these uh, interviews online because uh, I mostly conducted, actually I completed my PhD uh, while uh, during COVID basically. Uh, the sample intersects distant age groups with the youngest member being in the in their early 20s, I would say, and the oldest being in their late 70s, and encompasses basically three different categories of participants. So core supporters, mid and higher ranking leaders. So the article, um, well, uh, adopts a meso level uh, organizational analysis, which is built upon insiders a reflection on the Nahda specialization and how this was basically theorized and perceived by a Nahda's base. Builds, the article builds an institutional perspective, basically, because it actually frames a Nahda as both uh, an institution and as an organization and defines this movement as a socially conservative and politically active organization um, for whom Islamic references basically are employed selectively, yet they still offer meanings basically to the organizational structures and objective and also to the collective activities and behavior of, of, of its members. So there are three important concepts that I often refer to uh, in, uh, that I will refer to in this talk. First of all, um, the concept of organizational identity, which basically answered, answers the questions, who are we as an organization? Uh, by referring basically to the organization's affiliates perception of, uh, of the group's distinctive uh, and enduring characteristics and value system. Then I will refer to the concept of systemness, which basically refers to uh, the organizational property which results from the presence of coherence and cohesion. This is a concept uh, that I borrowed from the literature on party politics, more than organizational studies. Uh, while organizational coherence um, denotes basically the extent to which party members tend to share uh, a common value system, but also policy goals. Cohesion is more intended as uh, the degree of unity, so and the discipline achieved basically through the existence of a sort of of a series of institutional mechanisms that encourage the elite 
the core members and the base to basically follow the party lines. Um, including, of course, mechanisms of leadership rotation. Finally, I will often refer to this concept that is identity work. What does that mean? It is a concept that uh, um, that is intertwined with organization with theory of organizational studies. Uh, it is a concept that refers to basically to the purposive action. Uh, of reconstructing, resisting, but also recrafting newly introduced organizational identities or ideas. And this is extremely relevant to understand what's happening within Nahda in, uh, in the past five years. Um, based on this uh, concept, of course, uh, while well, this article uh, implies the identifications uh, assumes a very important role um, here. Uh, it is a role through which actually individuals and actors are able to accept, resist, or reject a much broader change process. So I'll go straight through to the findings here. So basically, out of these 22 uh, semi-structured interviews and uh, thematic analysis that I conducted, uh, I realized that one of the main uh, factors that contributed to Ennahda's low systemness is an ineffective theorization of the need for change. And this is something that obviously came from the top, from the party leadership, but it has been also impacted by the bottom up based on how actually the base, but also the mid-ranking um, mid leaders actually perceived and re-theorized the need for change based on, on their own views. So uh, as well, this is quite common. I think this is something that has been probably mentioned by a number of scholars. Um, in 2016, the Tunisian uh, and not this president, basically, uh, Rashid Ranoushi, basically, uh, ahead of the party's 10th Congress, announced to the French daily Le Monde that, well, we are heading towards transforming the party into one which only specializes in political activity. He said, we are finally exiting political Islam. We are entering Muslim democracy. Hence, we are Muslim Democrats and we don't define ourselves as affiliates of political Islam. So he basically theorized and framed at the beginning uh, this idea of specializing into political uh, activities only as a necessary and a functional um, functional ch change, basically. Um, basically, the party leadership of Ennahda in 2016 saw the specialization as, a first of all, a way to normalize the party position based on the 2014 constitutional text, explaining that, well, the Tunisian society is already Muslim and has recovered its Arab Islamic heritage. So there is no longer any justification for us to, um, to basically uh, remain affiliated and connected with this idea of, uh, of being an Islamist uh, movement. But internally, inside the Nahda, well, um, the specialization did not really appear to be conceivable as a, a rupture, basically, or the exit uh, from political Islam, as actually the, the leadership, the party uh, president uh, referred to following the 10th uh, Congress. Indeed, some senior leaders, um, let's say mid-ranking leaders, alluded to another specialization as a change of very small dimension, providing that actually um, the introduction of, a, of the specialization as an organization 
as an organizational idea and new value was not supposed to be a means to drop the ideological the ideological references to Islam uh, overnight, quite the opposite. So the specialization motion endorsed in 2016, uh, according to some of the members that I interviewed, um, provided an answer to a discussion on the link between politics and religion that can actually be traced back to the late 80s. In fact, one of my interview interviewees stated that we and Nahda decided to get out of the, the rigid categorization between the ideological and the political. So we said no, finally, because a political party can have an ideological foundation regardless of its type, but we can specify our work. So this was the rationale behind actually, that's at least what some of the, of the mid-ranking leaders thought. They thought that this was the rationale behind the specialization, which is quite different from the way uh, the party president theorized the, the, the rationale uh, and the need for actually uh, specializing in political activities and separating the religious from, uh, from the political um, sphere in, uh, in the Nahda. So basically this quotation indicates that the integration of specialization as a new organizational value function as actually a mechanism to retain the ideological reference to Islam while specializing, while separating the practical activities, the work, basically. Although now, uh, well, uh, this makes sense to some within a Nahda, uh, still this explanation did not really make sense to others. In fact, um, I realized while interviewing people that, by contrast, to party newcomers who were younger, who were in their 30s or in their 40s, who joined Ennahda after 2011 and then after 2016, so those who were actually a product of the specialization, basically, they started to see the specialization as the beginning of an ongoing secularizing process uh, at the culmination of which the party would, would have become more inclusive, more diverse, a party of national conservative. So basically, although another specialization in politics has been theorized as uh, you know, a requisite for the party to enter Tunisia domestic politics, of course, to be accepted. Uh, and the idea of specialization was framed as functional superior. So on pragmatic grounds, basically, was justified uh, on pragmatic grounds. Um, a broad acceptance, I would say, of, um, of new organizational ideas and practices, we know that in theory, can only occur once it is internalized as valuable in itself, as meaningful in itself. In this case, ideas, organizational ideas, will be likely to imit be imitated and survive across generations because they are recognized as cognitively legitimacy, legitimate. However, in the case of Nahda, things were particularly did not really go this way because actually the case itself uh, shows that, well, the ineffective theorization of the need for change um, basically did not allow the internalization of this new organizational value and the broad and the homogeneous acceptance of this organizational value by its uh, base and by its also by its actually uh, mid and some of the high ranking um, uh, members of the Nahda. However, this is not all because uh, continue, while actually continuing to interview in, in a, a couple of different rounds, I realized in the post-2016 period, 
and Nahda encompassed three very different generations of members. And this is what actually helped me to explain what was happening inside the Nahda. So the first generation basically corresponded to uh, an older generation uh, who used to be basically uh, uh, dedicated to the religious activities, to the so-called dawa, and were responsible for the religious education of the new affiliates. The second generation was quite different, though, because this was the one which was heavily politicized because compri comprised members and also current leaders were engaged in the student movement in the 70s and in the 80s, in the union and also in human rights advocacy groups. Lately, there was an additional group of members who emerged actually as a direct result of the Arab uprisings and the specialization. And this included basically both the sons and daughters of individuals who had family ties with the movement, so who had family ties with the older two generations, but also um, a smaller group of younger and non-religious conservative members who had joined the party, as I said, in 2011 and 2016. So basically, I realized that while I was trying to uh, grasp from the interviewees uh, how they conceived the organizational identity of a Nahda after the specialization, I realized that I was getting very contrasting views. So basically, Nahda meant di very different things to a number of, uh, of, of members based on uh, this differentiation of uh, this generational divide basically characterizing uh, the party in the recent times. In fact, uh, well, uh, first of all, I realized that the rebranded identity of the party of Muslim Democrats theorized by uh, the party's president, by Ranushi, was resisted by senior members and high and mid-ranking leaders who belong to the first two generations, who, because they were still identifying basically the old role of the movement as the defender of the Islamic identity. Although this was supposed to be protected by the 2014 constitution uh, legal framework. And Basically, according to some of these participants belonging to this group, uh, there was a sort of a causal relationship between what they were calling like the um, uh, crimes, uh, um, the rise of uh, drug abuse and the general costumes with the fact that another withdrew from the religious education and the religious project for Tunisia. But also I realized that among this group, actually there were a lot of other sub themes that included like criticism and complaints about the prolonged collaboration that Nada had with parties that originated basically from uh, the old regime, which uh, according to some members actually harmed in Nahda constituency considerably. And also some of these members were complaining and criticizing the abandonment basically of uh, in Nahda, uh, by in Nahda of its social project that has led Tunisians to according to them, to live in a period of uh, disarray in terms of religious uh, identity. But then there was another category of participants uh, who basically comprised a small group uh, belonging to another's latest uh, generation of less religious uh, members who obviously struggled to identify their persona with the idea of the party of Muslim Democrats because they saw Enada as a party of national conservatives because they didn't see themselves as, as uh, practicing Muslims, but only as socially conservative Tunisians, right? So they are the ones who tend to actually uh, conceive Enada as uh, a party of national conservatives who's actually secularizing fast and will at some point become uh, completely 
secularized um, uh, Tunisian party. So basically, uh, based on uh, on these findings, on the, on the themes that I analyzed from uh, these twenty two semi structured interviews, I concluded that first of all, the non homogeneous identification with the party of Muslim Democrats has, to some extent not only affected the systemness, the coherence and cohesion of another, but has also had another effect of the effect of redirecting the process of change that Nahda was trying actually to complete and was still experiencing on very different paths. In fact, basically, uh, data collected between 2020 and 2021 indicate that party members clearly function as agents of change because, as we can see in this case, they managed to trigger a process of recrafting organizational identities driven by their self-perception um, based on their affiliation to Nahda. So, uh, as I said, well, we do have among the elite of um, high and middle rank leaders, there are members who refer to Nahda as the civil party of Muslim Democrats. So they do endorse uh, Ranoushi's uh, label um, completely. But then we have direct challengers of this label who are basically the non-religious conservative members who cannot really identify themselves with the party of Muslim Democrats. And they refer already to Nahda as a party of national conservatives. So and also we have another generation, like an older generation who believes that Ennahda is still something bigger than a political party. It is still a comprehensive movement which uh, is supposed to uphold a much more noble objective, which is the one of defending the Arab Islamic identity of Tunisia, which again is connected to the identity of the Islamist party that Ranoushi actually denied after 2016. So just to conclude, well, I can see that the organization uh, after 10 years since its legal reappearance on the Tunisian uh, political uh, scene has found itself in uh, stuck in a limbo of divergent group identities. They, Compri comprise the party consensus clearly, but also the cohesion. And that also contributed actually to confusing the image of the movement in the eyes of both old supporters and the new electorate that another was trying to, um, uh, to basically um, um, to win over in, uh, in, the, in the before 2021. But also I realized that after the specialization, after the, a decade of consensual politics, and Nahda's history of ordeals, Islam as an emotional tie, but also the very old um, dissident subculture built around identity, faith, and uh, collective behavior, is no longer able to homogenize in, to homogenize the movement as he used to basically uh, before the Arab uprisings. So basically, to conclude, uh, well, I will say that uh, what what I argue in this article is that the case study of Nahda illustrates that its transition into a civil party of Muslim Democrats was not really followed by. Uh, a homogeneous identification of Nahdawis, members of a Nahda, with the organizational idea of, of the party of Muslim Democrats. What are the lessons that can we learn from this case? Well, three lessons. Um, based on what I've said, I think that after it's, you know, a national breakthrough and after a significant organizational change, an Islamist born party can experience low systemness owing to an ineffective, inadequate justification of the need for change, 
but also a problematic identification with a, a new refashioned organizational identity imposed from the top down and an uneasy coexistence of very distinct group identities, as it is the case of um, Ennahda's, uh, Ennahda right now, basically. Now, although the theory on organizational change that I employed basically in this study uh, condense that, well, if new organizational ideas gain social consensus about their pragmatic value, they are likely to successfully diffuse, basically. The case study of Ennahda suggests actually that this is not always the case because the process of change can still be stalled, resist, and can still be internally contested and renegotiated by, by, mem by, by a party members and by the base. Uh, and also, um, it is interesting to note that actually the issue here is that, well, perhaps we should start rethinking about the way we approach change in the first place. And rather than framing change as a change process as uh, in a myopic way, as a linear and straightforward process, which should inevitably lead to a finite product, I think we might rethink the way we actually frame change and perhaps conclude that change can also be partial, contest, stalled, and re renegotiated by the receivers of change. So by the base of a movement, so from the bottom up, basically. Because change sometimes is simply like a very arduous uh, process uh, to partake uh, in until the end, right? And this is probably what um, holds true in the case uh, of Ennahda. And I'll stop right here. Uh, thank you very much. I hope everything was clear. That's fantastic. So we're going to ask questions. Um, thank you. I always enjoy reading and listening to you speaking about your project. So thank you very much. Um, Carmen, but would you do you have any questions? We also have Louis, Leah, if I pronounce your name correctly. So, any questions? Shall we start? Sure, I'll start. <clears throat> um, so I guess the first question is, uh, is just a question of fact. Um, before the coup or whatever we want to call it, um, and not a was a majority party in parliament correct and and how big was that um majority so that that's a simple that's an easy question um the second question is so the way that i think about um party politics in the united states and i know there's no i, I know it's not uh uh comparable in any way except that they're both organizations right with political yeah. goals um, the way that I think about the tensions within the organization is um, ideology versus pragmatics or ideolo ideological purity versus political power. So the, the more strict, the more the, the purer the party, the less likely are they are going to be able to appeal to a, a, a wider variety of people. Um, the wider variety of people they appeal to, the less ideological they are. Um, and so it strikes me that, I mean, you are, so you're showing that um, there's, there's a variety of uh, causes to the fracturing of the identity within Anada. Um, how much of it was sort of coherent, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Planned, I guess. How much of it was, we need to have a big tent in order to maintain our parliamentary majority. Um, and the bigger the tent we have, the, the more likely we're gonna be able to do, have political accomplishments. And yet the bigger the party is, the less clear what it is we're trying to accomplish, right? <laughs> 
So uh, how much of that was conscious on the part of the, and I'm talking now about the elites, um, were they thinking, let us, let us diffuse the ideology in order to create uh, a larger tent um, or was it that there were these various forces that were compelling it to enlarge the tent? For example, the people that you identify as, uh, not, I can't remember exactly how you put it, non-religious conservatives um, or less religious conservatives. So that's, so that's my question. Oh yeah, okay, perfect. Thank you very much. I'm gonna start from the second one. So it was, let's start with saying that Ennahda's leadership is very politically savvy compared to the leadership of other Islamist movements. So honestly, I pretty sure that it was a, there was a calculus behind because Ennahda, in order to uh, remain in power in uh, these 10 years, what, what he tried to do it was basically, he started to target a different class, a social class, as part of its new constituency. But in order to do that, they needed to actually include in, in, in its own files and ranks dif very different profiles, such as unveiled women. And this is the reason why actually they um, uh, included in their independent list while running in the municipal election in 2019, an unveiled woman who then became actually the first mayor, female mayor of Tunis in 2019. It was another's candidate. So they did all they, they did all this to change actually, it was an intentional, um, purposive change in order to target the upper middle class because that was really and also they were targeting actually they were trying to widen in the constituency in particular areas of um of of uh, tunisia where they never been very successful in the past particularly the those areas where people tend to be more secular a more upper class. So this was clearly like uh, part of, uh, of of the party strategy. So it was a, a calculus, honestly, in order to um, remain in power in, uh, in 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 this you know decade, basically. And honestly, they managed to do so. I think that despite losing its um, constituency, they compared to other parties who simply which simply disappeared, you know, in uh, 10 years. Um, another was the only one which managed to remain uh, in power. And but this was also the reason, was actually the reason behind its uh, demise in 2021. Because considering the, uh, the precipitating economic uh, situation that actually Tunisia experienced from 2011, to up to now, another was seen as the sole responsible for this. Although another has always actually governed in national coalitions, never by itself. And sometimes this was actually also like, uh, was not only because of the electoral results, but because of a number of formal and informal agreements that another political elite and other um, political actors in Tunisia agreed upon after the Arab uprisings, such as the Carthage Agreement was one of, uh, you know, was an agreement between Ennahda's leaders and leaders of the old regime uh, who established other parties. So the vision of post-revolution uh, Tunisia was actually the vision of a country that will always be governed by a national coalition with very little opposition, which is something that did not really help to articulate different economic uh, visions. And I believe it literally increased the level of uh, disillusionment of people with party politics as a whole, which led to the rise of polarizing anti-system 
populisms uh, on the occasion of the election of 2019, which is again, the president is of Tunisia. The current president is the, is the example of this, you know, anti-system uh, populism. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Carmen. I have a, I have two questions actually. Um, so my my first question is about women. We are also getting into International Women's Day, so I think it's a good end. So if you look at Anatha's woman participation and engagement, you can see that it was really dubious before the Arab Spring. And then after the Arab Spring, it kind of went up quite a lot. There was a lot of discussions about values and inclusion of women and they wanted to attract. And then you have a decline again. So they they will be, and you mentioned about the first unveiled woman, but if you look at yeah. the number of women who are involved with Anatha, they came down. So I kind of wondered if you would like to give us a little bit of commentary about how because often, as you know, for Islamic parties, this relationship is the most problematic relationship. You you really don't know what to do. Like, do you gonna are you gonna contact with them? Do you engage women in your party politics or not? Where do you kind of put? So I was wondering if you could um give some commentary about the relationship that Anafsa has or not. Yeah. And I was wondering if you my second question is about the future of Anafsa. And I wanted to know if you could comment about do you think they can survive? Because it's a very difficult position, isn't it? So from one side you have to open up and you have to bring more secular people into that. But at the same time, as you do, you are losing your traditional base who want you to be Islamic and have Islamic values and push for that Sharia based um, discussion, particularly because Democrat Muslims is a very kind of vague interpretation and definition. So would you like to comment on these questions? Yeah. Thank you. I'll start with the last one, with the future of El Nahda. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I don't see the future at the moment for El Nahda and for, another, for a number of political parties in Tunisia, because now El Nahda, uh, first of all, it's a leadership and the majority of the members of the political bureau are in prison at the moment. Uh, also, the ones who are not in prison are engaging in uh, in the so-called National Salvation Front, and I, I wrote about it. Basically, after two thousand twenty-one, um, after the the president uh, declaration of uh, uh, let's say the president presidential power grab. Uh, well, what happened is that um, the People's Assembly was uh, dissolved and he also prompted a number of constitutional reforms that uh, recast the, the, the Tunisia on the path of the strong presidentialism again. Okay, so the political life or politi for political parties in Tunisia is quite limited at the moment. So I don't really see the future in the sense that now, Nahda's priority is no uh, longer political, but it's survival. And he entered the survival mode, I would say. They are protesting again, which reminds me a bit of what Nahda used to do in 2000, basically, against Ben Ali. Or what they are doing, are, they are trying to mobilize uh, in with other political parties uh, and a number of civil society organizations for human rights, basically. Particularly, they're trying to demand the uh, release of uh, political prisoners uh, uh, at the moment, most of whom are actually from El Nahda, to be honest, which is doesn't come uh, as a surprise. It's uh, because it was one of the main parties that since the very beginning tried to um, raise awareness in the country about the dangers of uh, democratic uh, backsliding, basically, um, after July 2021. However, the, 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 the Tunisian society was so polarized that unfortunately Tunisians this time did not really, they were not able to come united uh, against the common enemy. They were supposed to be actually, I say it, 
quite the opposite. Uh, the people actually, a number of uh, civil society organizations, but also a number of political parties and the labor union at the beginning sided with, uh, with the president. So now really Enahda at the moment, its focus is surviving and trying to get his political prisoners uh, released uh, as soon as possible. But uh, I don't see that coming at the moment, uh, and it doesn't look like the president is willing to make any conception on this. Regarding women, I had a very interesting uh, interviews uh, with uh, with at least I would say eight nine women from the political bureau of Ennahdas. There are the problem in Ennahda they were complaining about was the fact that there is still women are, women are not represented in uh, in the parliamentary block enough and they were right i actually realized there was less than the 11% of uh, of of uh, of the women of of and nahdawis uh, was actually women represented in the parliamentary bloc. So, and also Nahda had, all, had some sort of organizational uh, issues because uh, for instance, the political bureau and the parliamentary bloc were not equally uh, included in, uh, in, uh, in the committee, in the party committee tasked with drafting the political vision for the party. So there was sort of, you know, the parliamentary bloc had the upper hand and was the one dominated, male dominated, while the political bureau had more of, let's say, less functional, um, less functional uh, prerogatives, but they had like more women in it. And I found that like a bit interesting to observe. I remember that many of them uh, were complaining about the leadership of Ranushi, saying that, well, they were the first ones and more critical in pointing uh, out the fact that, to some extent, it was abusing power from their perspective for um in the sense that he should have let the you know the presidency uh, to someone else to someone perhaps younger more connected to the new generation that's one of the themes that was recurring quite a lot in the interviews but also i i've seen that um they reposed very high hopes in the 11th Congress because they were waiting to uh, play like perhaps um, a more um, uh, important role within the party. But unfortunately, this Congress never happened. At the beginning, it was postponed a couple of times because of... Uh, of COVID, it was supposed to be held in 2019, then in 2020, and then uh, and then there was like, you know, economic crisis, the post-COVID, and then finally 2021, Kai said uh, with the presidential uh, coup. So I think they were, uh, by now, even though I didn't have a chance to get in contact with them or run, uh, you know, or have another round of interviews, I believe they must be quite uh, actually uh, disappointed uh, based on what I heard before 2020 and 2021. So yeah, they were awaiting more for more participation and for playing, obviously, uh, a more political role within the party. That, uh, yeah. Well, thank you very much. Any other questions? Actually, I do have one more, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Could you talk a little bit about local politics? Um, so presumably uh, at the level of municipalities or other smaller governmental units below the level of uh, the national government, those are still, are those contested? Um, are they appointed or how does that work? And does it not have any, any uh, role in local politics? 
Yes, so that's a very good question. Well, let's start with sign that in 2019, there was the latest municipal elections. Tunisia reported a very low turnout, alarming, alarming low turnout. So after not even 10, 10 years since the Arab uprisings, this actually sends a, a very important message, right? That is, people are already fed up with the system and clearly they are disillusioned with the idea, with the political process uh, itself. But then, uh, well, the idea of the, the president um, was actually to have some sort of decentralized political system which would have which would have made uh, people directly uh, involved in uh, in in politics. That's exactly what in his electoral campaign was trying to uh, explain to to the people, to the voters. So he changed the constitution in a way that basically. Um, municipal uh, councils should play a more crucial role uh, in uh, in politics. However, let's say that the, the voting actually of these constitutional reforms also showed a very low turnout. So now it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen in uh, in the next uh, in the in the next elections but I, I believe that more people will be will continue to be disillusioned actually with how things are going uh, since 2021 so if there was uh, you know a very low turnout in 2019 um i believe that the trend will be most likely the same if not worse uh, in the next elections. But uh, yeah, I mean, we do tend to consider in the West, you know, the municipal election as the highest move, democratic moment in a country, right? But uh, I believe that uh, this is something that Tunisians might actually uh, contest quite, uh, quite easily, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um Julia, uh, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Julia, Come yeah, in. yeah, yeah. Julia. Julia. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if, like, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, can. I can hear you, yes, Julia. Okay, I have my video uh, disabled, basically, because, I mean, uh, it says that I cannot activate it, but I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm here. Um, Sorry for not being able to turn it off the camera. No, when he, I um, mean, first and foremost, me and Carmen like already met. We are um, good friends, and it's just a pleasure to to hear her work. And uh, it was very fascinating, also because, um, to be honest, I mean, North Africa for me, it's, I mean, uh, Islamist uh, experiences are quite far from what I'm doing because I'm I'm working on the Jordanian Muslim Brotherhood. And I wanted to ask you, like, um, about um, and then uh, more or less the role of perhaps repression and trauma, historically speaking. Mm -hmm. How would you see, like, the reverberations of this assault from different quarters, from the West to Europe, internally speaking, against political Islam, to the point that it became like an an, an impossible project, uh, even if I mean, there, there is a lot of Islamic philosophy that could prove us the country. Of course, it only remains theorization on paper, but it really, it really was absorbed into tropes of terrorism and fundamentalism. We all remember this ongoing era that really flattens the conversation and really hits also mainstream politics within countries. And then we have all of those generations, of, all of those people are always in prisons and we have even literature on prisoners. So I wanted yeah. to, to know a bit more, what are the reverberations and the specificities of the Tunisian case? Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no, it's, well, first of all, I believe that, I, that's what I noted at least, um, that actually the return in prison of some of uh, Nahda's leaders did not particularly make the news. I had this feeling like it was, it was not really like something that 
mm, that we really talked about or heard a lot about in the West, first of all, which I found, you know, interesting, especially because, like, you know, uh, a personality like Ranushi is also like um, a philosopher, right? Is actually um, a distinguished, actually, um, uh, theorist of uh, a Muslim democracy. And he's also well connected with Western countries. So he has been living, you know, in uh, in the UK for quite a long time, in, uh, in France. However, we do not, it seems like, the Kai Said managed to normalize this new securitization of, uh, you know, Islamist parties uh, quite successfully. You know, it might be because of obviously political reasons, but also because uh, of, you know, the partnerships he managed to, uh, the, some Western countries, including, you know, Italy, um, established with them. Uh, so I, well, I think the Tunisians again. Uh, it's. I think the Tunisia is a country that we often get wrong, for a number of reasons, uh, in the West, and uh, perhaps this is the reason why we still, um, you know, there is not much, uh, we hear about it. Um, but what I think it's uh, much, you know, it's actually worth it to to notice is. The repercussions of actually of um uh, of the of tra of trauma uh in uh, on Enahda itself like I I think that it's uh, it's gonna be this time it's gonna be probably a, a bit harder for them to uh to go through like you know the trauma for a second time after after being at the forefront of institutional politics in Tunisia for 10 years, I can guarantee you that they didn't see it, you know, uh, such a situation coming. Like, the way, like, when I remember talking to them uh, uh, until 2021, and sometimes I was trying to raise the question about, like, my suspicion, you know, towards Kaiseid conduct, but they were, like, quite sure that the you know that the democratic um consolidation of the country was on the right track and the things you know would not really uh, be undone as then was the case so what i wonder and i don't have actually um an answer to that is whether the this new trauma of uh, the Enahda's leaders are actually experiencing my um, impact, the, 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 the change process, the Enahda uh, uh, ex initiated again, but towards a completely different direction. I wonder if Enahda might try to re-ideologize and uh, reassert the references to Islam after what's happening uh, now to, 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 to its members, uh, considering that now actually there is again the securitization of, his, you know, of, uh, of Islamist or Islamist inspired uh, activities. So I think that would be interesting, uh, you know, to to explore as you know, uh, as perhaps future future research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for asking great questions and for you, Carmen. It is always great to see you, and I wish you all the best. I know it is very late in London now, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being with us in such a late um, evening time. No and I wish you and I wish you all the best. And we hope that we see you more engaged with us and continue these conversations with us about. Let me know when you come to London, please. Absolutely. Everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much for this exchange. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you again for having me. And uh, I'll yeah, I'll talk to you soon, hopefully. Definitely. Thank you, yeah. Carmen. Thank you, Carl. Good night. Have a good, good day. Everyone.
Thank, Thank you, Gina, you, for connecting. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.